Welcome everyone to another episode of Act in Perspective podcast. If you like what you hear today, I ask that you subscribe. It's simple, free, and you're helping this channel grow. Now today's topic is all about humor. Why humor? Well, humor is a universal human experience across cultures. We love to laugh. We invest a lot of time, energy, and money into creating laughter. People often know what funny is when they see it, but have a difficult time describing it. If we ask the average person what is funny, we're likely to get a blank stare. Moreover, why do we laugh? What effects does it have for ourselves and society as a whole? What are the different types and functions of humor? And most importantly, how can we best harness this power to improve our world? Well, today's guest has spent years of his life studying these very questions. Dr. Tom Ford is a professor of psychology at Western Carolina University. He is a former editor-in-chief of Humor, the International Journal of Humor Research. He and his colleagues have developed the prejudice norm theory, an influential theory on the impact of disparaging humor on prejudice and discrimination. He is the co-author of The Psychology of Humor and Integrative Approach and co-editor of The Social Psychology of Humor, among other related works. We first open up with defining what humor is and how it functions. Please help welcome Dr. Tom Ford. Yeah. That's a, that's a hard question to answer. What you know? What is humor? And it's because people use humor and uh, use the term humor in so many different contexts to mean a number of different things. And you know, I I see humor as uh, like you said. Uh, well, I think people see humor as you said, uh, like they see concepts such as beauty. Uh, they know it when they see it, but mm -hmm. most of the time people aren't all that interested or concerned about defining it in, in very precisely. Scholars are concerned with defining it precisely. Um, and it's interesting that scholars don't agree on a common definition of humor. Well, there isn't one definition of humor, humor that is uh, accepted across all of the humor scholars and all of the different uh, humor studies disciplines. In fact, most scholars define humor in terms of the specific research question or empirical study at the time. Um, so that said, uh, in the book, uh, The Psychology of Humor, Rob Martin and I uh, wanted to define humor very broadly in a way that hopefully encompasses the the essence of the in the whole experience of humor. Um, and I think most fundamentally, we define humor as a form of social play. Um, I don't think any definition of humor that doesn't make the distinction between playful and serious uh, is, is really going to stand up. And so humor is a form of social play uh, that usually involves a perception of some sort of incongruity you know, a violation of an expectation and a violation of an expected pattern in a conversation and so on. And this can produce a unique emotional response that we call mirth or amusement. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's expressed behaviorally through laughter or, or smiling. And so I, I think that would be a sort of a textbook ready definition that I would give of humor. Um, and and I see laughter as, as the behavioral component of humor. And if you think about that term or the, the definition, mm -hmm. um, a form of social play that usually involves the perception of incongruity that results in an emotional response of mirth or amusement expressed behaviorally through smiling or laughter. Um, we see humor as, inv as involving then three psychological components. Uh, perception or cognition, uh, emotion, and then behavior as well. And so we, we then would suggest that laughter is part of that humor experience. It's the behavioral expression of the emotion, mirth, or amusement. Mm -hmm. Of course, we understand that laughter can result from nerves, nervousness, or, or, or other, other sources. But the experience of mirth and amusement is typically expressed through, you know, uh, this positive affective uh, response of laughter or smiling. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I would think of laughter too as opposed to any other behavioral response that we could give. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, what is it about, do you think about laughter? I think that you touched on this in, in the social psychology of humor. What about laughter, uh, that type of behavior mm-hmm. that, that functions as part of humor? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's uh, you know, involuntary, it's reflexive response, um, uh, and it, it's, it is related to uh, certain uh, changes in the brain, particularly in the uh, um, autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. Uh, so when, when people are, are laughing, that uh, typically uh, stimulates the... Um, the, the sympathetic nervous activity of, of increased heart rate, um, uh, the, the, the general fight or flight response, as well as the uh, sort of some increases in cortisol into the bloodstream. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that there's sort of a cast, somewhat of a cascading uh, effect of laughter in terms of other physiological responses. And yeah. That's a bit of a trigger. Uh, for some of these responses. It was interesting. Uh, there's one study I am recalling from that, um, from our physiological chapter, chapter on physiological psychology and the psychology of humor, uh, exposure to what, to the Monty Python, so Monty Python, uh-huh. 90 minutes or so of a, night, of a Monty Python movie, uh, it led to the release of cortisol in the bloodstream and, uh, and uh, increased um, heart rate, um, adrenaline in the bloodstream as well. And it was, so it, it did produce a number of physiological changes. But let me also say that, that that research doesn't separate laughter from that mirth experience. Yeah. And so I, I'm not suggesting that laughter all by itself produces those or is a trigger for those uh, sorts of uh, physiological responses but tied together with you know as, as part of the humor experience uh there, there's some association yeah yeah it's interesting to me that we there's no just one function of humor right, right. Uh, there's it's it's multifunctional can we get into the yeah. different types of functions of humor yeah um, in different contexts maybe sure sure but um uh, John Meyer, a uh, communication scholar, he has identified four different functions of, of humor that social functions of humor that fit on a continuum. And I think this is a very useful continuum from uh, very un- uniting to very divisive. Mm-hmm. And at the very uh, at the most uniting end of the continuum, he identifies this func- the fun- a function of humor called identification. And The idea here is that humor helps people to identify with one another, to bond with one another, and to connect with one another. Mm -hmm. And that uh, sharing humor can bring people together. It can serve as a basis for uh, forming connections between them. Um, According to to, uh, Meyer's model, this, this occurs when humor reflects or evokes uh, shared meaning or shared experiences, shared perspectives, shared identities. Um, and, and, and so it's through the humor then we, we can you know, bond and relate to one another over our shared common experience. There's uh, uh, some good you know, one-liners, uh, it, it's jokes and memes capitalize on, uh, on you know, shared norms, shared experiences and, and values. Uh, that that can function to create this sense of togetherness. You know, I saw one, for example, uh, pretty recently uh, that I think is 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 aimed toward people who, uh, in my generation, who grew up in the late '70s, and said, uh, "My curfew is was lightning bugs and street lights." You know, my mom didn't call my cell phone; she yelled my name. And, um, you know, I played outside, not online. Wow. And so most people of my age can relate to this meme. I mean, it draws out our common experience of, uh, of being children in the 70s, which is very different from the norms and customs that children experience today. 
And so the, the humor then shows our similarity and allows us to relate or identify to one another over that common experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so humor can be very uh, uniting in that sense. and uh, It can have a, a very positive social consequence. Um, another function of humor that Mayer, Mayer uh, addresses is called clarification. Uh, clarification humor involves this flash of insight, uh, this new perspective on something. It suddenly creates for a person a different way of seeing something or thinking about something. It's the experience that you have is, oh my gosh, I haven't thought of it that way before. Oh, that's so true. And, and that's the, the sort of uh, function that he's referring to in clarification. I see many stand-up comedians like uh, George Carlin as being just, uh, uh, Ricky Gervais as being masters of this type of humor. Um, I see this sort of clarification that, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way, reaction as I watch their routines. Humorous uh, one-liners uh, often, uh, you know, Mark Twain quotes are, are good examples of this sort of clarification function of humor. Uh, I know, what, you know, one, uh, I think this is a Mark Twain quote, you know, never argue with a fool. Uh, they'll drag you down uh, to their level and beat you with experience. Uh, and so it's, oh my God, yeah, I never thought of it that way. That makes so much sense. It's that sort of response to the, that, that's this clarification function. Can I interject here? Uh, yeah. Because you made, um, well, just in terms, I want to get back to, to identification too, but in, in yeah. clarification, are they really clarifying or are they, or are they like adding a heuristic to yeah. understanding life where, okay, this is a simplified way of understanding life and then people take it like, oh, okay, now it all makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, probably both. I think it's yeah. you know, adding a new twist, yeah. a, new, a new angle for looking at something, a new way. In that, in that sense, it could be dangerous too, right? Where like you, you're, um, the, you're adding a uh, simplification to life to, to get a laughter, but then yeah. people take it to heart like, okay, and they start seeing the world from that perspective. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I had uh, uh, come across uh, you know, something on the web. So I'm, I'm not prepared to talk about this, but it, it, the, there was an article suggesting that uh, millennials get most of their news from late night uh, talk show hosts uh, who, who, who do exactly what we're talking about, you know, yeah. uh, who satirize. Yeah. And their view of the world, then, according to this article, is uh, uh, shaped uh, by the, the satire uh, yeah. or the satirical view that the, the hosts present. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. I think that's uh, and it carries with it. A, a, um, that's yeah, some important consequence. That's changed in our culture, I see, because I remember I now I, I guess we're about the same age. I do, I do remember the 70s and 80s, and and yeah. it didn't seem like the late night talk show hosts like Carson and Letterman really talked too much about politics. Uh, I guess they they did, but not nearly as much as today. Um, and and when uh, the Daily Show came came on, the Colbert right. Report. Yeah, it was all political, um, but in a satirical kind of way. And right. then, um, and you'll see all the late night talk show hosts talk about it's all it's all politics. Yeah, right? but it was slamming Trump. It was slamming um, a it was definitely a liberal slant. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, I know we'll get into that too because that there was a whole section that that. Uh, social psychology of humor is what effect is that actually having? I would always suspect that that was having a a tremendous effect when all of the late night talk show hosts are are um, slamming a certain comedian that's mm -hmm. going to sway public opinion from the other side. Mm -hmm. And it has, um, and the book talks about no, it has a, it has the opposite effect um, to certain people. Um, but I'm sorry, uh, just uh, go, go ahead with the functions of 
Yeah, well, um, so again, we've got this continuum from humor, humor having both positive and negative consequences, acting as you know a double-edged sword, or you know a, a, um, that that can unite or divide. And there are different ways that humor can be useful uh, to create sort of unity, to create connections among people, and and Meyer talks about these these two two sort of connective unity functions of humor, the, the uh, identification and clarification. And then uh, he moves to the very far end of the um, sort of dividing end of the, the, the continuum and talking about uh, differentiation. And then uh, here, I think the most divisive form of, of, of humor is, is disparagement humor. Um, and you know, disparagement humor is humor that denigrates, puts down, uh, belittles, demeans an individual or uh, a social group. You know, racist, sexist humor would be good examples of that. And in fact, most research uh, on the functions of humor in intergroup settings uh, has focused on group-based disparagement humor. Um, and you know, what disparagement humor can can have uh, divisive functions in a couple of ways that it, it serves to mark boundaries you know that social outgroups are inferior uh, and worthy of denigration put down discrimination etc uh, so yeah, I I see uh, the the functions of humor uh, according to Myers model as being quite relevant for thinking about um, social relations in terms of sort of uh, just do, you know one-on-one -on -one, uh, interpersonal relationships to also a more group contexts where actually when well, I didn't cover this where um, we see an, an important function of humor within a within a social group that he refers to as enforcement oftentimes we use humor as a way to to enforce social norms uh, and, and this type of humor might be sort of a you know, teasing, uh, uh, ridicule that's lighthearted. Uh, it's not meant to, to really hurt and uh, it's not meant, it's necessarily meant to weaponize uh, or as a weapon like disparagement humor is. Um, but nevertheless, it can be used to uh, reinforce social norms, let people know when they stepped out of bounds. And so it's from an interpersonal relationship perspective, um, you know, identification functions are very important. You can see that in romantic relationships. Um, you know, when, when people use humor for that sort of affiliative identification function, well, it promotes intimacy, connection, and enjoyment. It, it helps people, couples to cope with stressful events and challenges. And then you, as we move to a broader group context, we see humor um, fun, and that enforcement function of humor seems to be pretty prominent as a way of kind of letting people know what the rules of the group are, what the norms are, and when you step out of line, as it were. And then when we think about intergroup uh, context, that's where disparagement humor seems to be most relevant in the forms of you know, racist, sexist uh, humor that, again, is the use of, it's using humor as a weapon uh, to hurt uh, social groups in, in this case. Right, right. But when you talk about function now, you're talking about is there, does there need, necessarily need to be a consensus between the speaker and listener for that function to be true? I mean, oh. we're not talking about function in an objective sense, we're talking about functional uh, function in a practical sense, Correct. where, right? Correct. So, yes. If Bill Burr says something, Bill Burr is a great example, or Ricky Gervais is, a, is an example where, you know, Ricky Gervais uh, uh, talks about um, obesity and, you know, and of a person who is obese may take great offense or Bill Burr talks about women and it sounds like he's disparaging women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a woman in the audience could be very offended. A man could be laughing and say, no, 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 this is not, I don't take this as disparaging. This is, 
this he's just making fun and it has an opposite relation or may have an opposite relation from disparagement to making fun of um people who simplify um you know whole genders you know yeah but you know i think that's that's an interesting distinction between you know the person in the audience who you know takes offense and, and has objection to the content of the humor material uh, versus somebody who says no no it, it's all in fun uh, I, you know i see and when you and you brought up forms of disparagement humor you know uh, yeah. uh, talking uh, putting down women or obese people and i see this disparagement humor as having you know two messages sort of an explicit message which is uh, communicated in the content of the of the humor and so maybe relying on stereotypes about women or some sort of dis disparagement of obese people okay then underneath that is the implied uh, it's an implicit uh, message that the explicit message isn't real okay it's play it's, okay. It, it isn't real and, and so uh, it, it, it doesn't, yeah, it's not meant to be taken seriously uh, because it is only meant to amuse. Right, there's subtleties with that. You know what I think of when you, when you said that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think of Don Rickles, right? Yeah. Who was, Don Rickles was pretty famous for, you know, getting up there in a roast and just putting down yeah. race, gender, ethnicity, what, I mean, wh whoever he can put yes. down. Yes. And, People were like, uh, you know, laughing across the desk, and it seemed, you know, it could be an uncomfortable laughter, uh, like, oh, is he is he really putting me down, or is he, um, or should I take this as part of um, lightheartedness? Exactly. Um, yeah, I I agree, and people differ in the degree to which they would give the comedian latitude yeah. to disparage in the name of fun you know yeah. so people differ in to in the degree to which they will interpret this sort of humor in a light-hearted humor mindset versus take it critically you know are you really are you going to take seriously the explicit message of of, of disparagement or mm -hmm. are you going to take more seriously the implicit message that this is all supposed to be fun uh, and it's not real, or it's just play. And, and uh, people differ in the degree to which their willingness to do that, I suppose. And that's actually called, there's a, uh, 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 that idea has been described as a personality trait called cavalier humor beliefs. And, you know, people differ in the degree to which they have a cavalier orientation to humor. That is the degree to which they will um, adopt that and they'll, they'll attend to that implicit subtext of, of humor that it's all play and adopt the uh, non-serious mindset accordingly. Uh, you know, some people will say anything goes if it's said in the name of humor. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what Don Rickle says, as long as it's meant to be funny, that means it's not real, it's all play let's take it as it's meant to be. And, and other people will right. say, well, actually, yeah, I don't see it that way. I, I feel like he is responsible for the content of his message, regardless of its form. I'm not right. buying that, uh, that subtext that anything goes if it's meant to be play. So. It occurs to me how complex this whole thing is. If you didn't right. know Don Rickles and you or, yeah. or say, if you did know Don Rickles, but the same thing came out of another person's mouth, yeah, um, you know, well, a shitstorm may happen because uh, that's going to be taken in a whole different light. So the complexities and subtleties of the context, correct, matter. Well, also if you take if you take the content of Don Rickles, uh, your humor, and, and you take out the humor. You know, you de jokeify it as it were, then it would be interpreted in the usual serious mindset and people would be aghast. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was uh, that uh, subtext of play, and all you're left with 
is that explicit message of disparagement and that would be yeah right well oftentimes you know if you ever if you ever watched don rickles and there's plenty of comedians that kind of exemplify don rickles today where they yeah. push the edge of yes. of, uh, of decency or um uh comfortableness right exactly. uh, and, and i guess that's what really makes good comedy today is if you push the edge when you get well known but even listening to um his you know if you if you watch him on youtube um what i found myself doing and when you talk about uh black people uh mm -hmm. as done, right and then you look i wish you wouldn't touch me sammy you people rust <laughs> It's a wonderful trait to uh, be able to, this wonderful black man, Sam, I kid you, we know each other a lot of years, really. And I love the black people, we need you people, I swear, because no Jew's gonna make up a train. <laughs> My kid, Sammy, you're a black man. I took a guess. If you ain't black, you fell into a bucket of M&Ms, I'll tell you. <laughs> My good friend Freddie Prince was your buddy, and we need the Puerto Rican people. I quote the grades of a, the, the grades, the words of a great Puerto Rican, Manuel Hatesis, who said to me in New York, "Do I'm a coffee." When the camera shoots to a black person, and they're laughing up a storm, mm -hmm. um, and so I found myself looking or orienting to that to the black person. It's like, oh, well, they're laughing. Okay, so okay. This is obviously uh, okay <laughs> humor, right? So that's mm -hmm. part of the context. Is is uh, that person on the dais? Everybody is laughing. Well, if if that one person he or she takes as like, well, oh, no, this is not funny, Don. Um, then they're on the out group, and everybody wants to be on the in group, and the and the and the. Uh, the problem with that oftentimes is, well, we allow certain disparaging humor to exist because we, we're not really quite sure what the intention was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that, yeah, that's fascinating. You know, what what yeah. I'm thinking about or focused on is your, your allusion to looking for cues to, in the environment, the social environment, for how you should respond, what's appropriate. <laughs> Should, should I go? Wait, should I focus on the implicit and uh, subtext that it's all play, or do I go with this and take it seriously? What do I do? Uh, and then so, well, here's somebody who looks like if anybody's going to take this seriously, and you know, it's it's that guy, and and he's playing. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, he's 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 uh, he's playing. He's laughing. So therefore, I can too. Um, and. And I think that reflects, as you said earlier, the importance of, of the social context for um, uh, to orienting people toward humor, for interpreting humor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of my students and I did a, a study uh, about a few years ago now in which we uh, demonstrated the importance of social context for uh, people's reactions um, their amusement and offense reactions to disparagement humor. And so we presented people with uh, sexist uh, jokes that were present and we created this elaborate scenario where we actually created a, a, a little comedy routine, stand up routine that was allegedly uh, performed by a comedian, a fictitious comedian and a fictitious club. But people were role playing. They were putting themselves in that setting uh, with others, and, um, and and we had other people's reactions, which would be sort of normal for a, uh, a comedy club, uh, as as well, sort of built into the scenario. And we found that people were much more tolerant of uh, sexist content, sexist jokes, in that setting compared to. Uh, around the water cooler at the office where the, it's the same same joke exact same con content uh exact same humorous intent mm -hmm. it's just it was in a workplace uh rather than a comedy club 
and people were just unwilling to play mm -hmm. in that workplace right. context. I, yeah, you, we, we can't play in this way in the workplace. That's not appropriate. In the comedy club, sure, mm -hmm. but, but not here. And yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. Now, it occurs to me, like when I was reading your article about uh, a disparaging humor versus, sub, uh, versus what is considered to be subversive, yeah. there is a subjectiveness to it and, uh, that um, depends upon, number one, the context, but also the listener. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and, and that there is a definite attitude um, or assumption that you're coming from, right? Mm -hmm. That um, would you agree that when you write about despair, you know, what is disparagement versus subversive? You're defining based upon kind of a subjective experience how you're, uh, what you're assuming to be uh, uh, part of those definitions. Yeah, uh, right. And I, I think you're right about the attitude and the intent. Um, of of the joker of the the humorist, you know, I disparagement humor it, it communicates like I said that explicit message based on some sort of disparagement or stereotype with an underlying message that uh, it's okay, it's play, um, it's okay to trivialize this sort of disparagement of these people, it's okay to make light, um, but subversive humor is just slightly different. Same explicit message based on this, you know, stereotypes and, and disparagement, but a different implicit subtext. It, the implicit subtext does not say it's okay to make light of disparagement of, of these people, but rather uh, the, um, uh, you know, sexism, racism is wrong. That's the implicit subtext. And, and so it looks the same on the surface. I, you know, one of my favorite examples of this, uh, well, there's several, but one that I've been showing students in my class, uh, psychology of humor class, is this um, skit by Key and Peel. It's called The Racist Zombies. And so it, it's really a skit. It's meant to, 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 uh, to be subversive to um, call out the, this absurdity in the, the, of, of racism. And, uh, but these, all right, so Key and Peele, they, they encounter all these white zombies uh, in, in this, this yeah. whatever, this dystopian world. And they're all, you know, they're afraid of these zombies because they think the zombies are gonna eat them. Uh, but the zombies are actually afraid of them. And the zombies, there's like a zombie family that are trying to keep the kid away from. And then there's a zombie in a car and they lock the doors when Key and Peele get close. And, and so again, they're playing on the stereotype of, of African-American men as criminal, aggressive, et cetera. And, but in doing that, you know, they're lampooning the bigotry. Yeah. Uh, but it's a subtle it's a, that's the you have to get that intent you have in order to understand to in order to truly appreciate that subversive subtext and yeah that takes a little bit of cognitive effort that so yeah, yeah well you know what i was thinking about when you were you were describing the keen pill um dave chappelle when he has his dave chappelle show yeah, and he yeah. played uh, the blind grand wizard of the. Oh yeah, 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 right. And then maybe we should put her on a plate and send her to Mexico, so the Mexicans lead her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> open up your heart and let that hate out. Yeah. 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 Your face. We want to see your face. Yeah. Who said that? You want to see my face? Wait, go on, wait. You want to see my face? Don't be afraid. There is cookie and punch for us to enjoy and we can make talk about white brotherhood. Thank y'all for coming. White power. Yeah, right, 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 right. And he didn't know that he was black. 
and no one yeah. knew he was black. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, people just find that. Yeah, of course, it was. It was. It was uh, interpreted to me as sub subversive humor. Yeah. Uh, to point out the disparities, or point out the absurdity of, hey, you know, uh, here's a, as a blind black person who doesn't know that he's black. Yeah, but yeah. he was always addressed that he was white. Yeah. And, but it, it brings up a larger point. You remember when you were wrote, wrote about uh, Stephen Colbert? This blew my mind. Stephen Colbert was often interpreted by liberals, uh, yeah. such as myself, as, hey, he's lampooning conservatives, right? Obviously, this is the explicit message as well as the implicit message for me. Mm -hmm. Also for conservatives, because conservatives thought, no, 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 he's, he's on our side. There was a yeah. joke in there about Greenland, how Greenland is going to be green again. And, and that joke uh, was missed by a whole, the half the United States. <laughs> well, well, maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. maybe half the United States. But anyway, the, the point is, we have such a variation turn in terms of how we interpret humor. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely right. And, you know, it really brings up sort of a, a broader phenomenon that we interpret things through all sorts of different lenses. Yeah. You know, we interpret through the lenses of our biases, Yeah. you know, whatever they might be. Uh, and, you know, the, I think the, Gosh, the first example, the one that stuck with me the most uh, about this sort of the um, uh, the fragility of subversive humor for actually challenging prejudice and bigotry comes from a study in what, 1974 by Vidmar and Rokic, uh, and they examined how people understood the TV show All in the Family. Yes. Now, exactly. I remember that show as a kid. Mm -hmm. I was too young to to appreciate. There's no like it. There's more to that than just being smart. There is, huh? Then how come we don't have a black president? I mean, some of our black people are just as dumb as Nixon. <laughs> we ain't got a black president, Jefferson, because God ain't ready for that yet. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> what? That's right. God's got to try it out first by making a black pope, which he ain't done yet. <laughs> oh, maybe that's because God ain't Catholic. <laughs> we know that one. The, the comic genius of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, they found that low prejudice people appreciated the subversive uh, intent. They understood that that the show was a, was a satire uh, on bigotry mm -hmm. uh, and that Archie Bunker was the buffoon. He was, he was the target of the humor. Higher prejudice people tended to see it differently. They tended to see, they tended to enjoy the show the same amount, but because the show disparaged the targets, you know, of, you know, of Archie Bunker's prejudice. Mm -hmm. And that brought them enjoyment. You see, with disparagement humor, uh, it's, a, it's meant to be enjoyed based on that explicit message, that explicit content message. Uh, but with subversive humor, it's meant to be enjoyed based on the implicit subtext. And that you may not get if you're looking at the surface message through the lens of your biases. Right. Yeah. Right. And so you may not completely follow or, or, or get that uh, latent su subtext. Right. And that, that's what happened. And, and the same with the, the study with uh, uh, you know, that Lamare et al. Uh, with um, uh, the Stephen Colbert is that you know, pe people tended to, to use the surface message, uh, or conservatives tended to use that surface message to infer. Uh, Colbert's uh, true beliefs, whereas uh, liberals understood, uh, they looked at the whole thing through a different lens and could better see the subversive uh, latent 
message mm -hmm. and they uh, interpreted or uh, inferred his uh, true beliefs from that. And so mm -hmm. you, you came up with different different uh, impressions of, of Colbert. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it, remember when it makes me think when Dave Chappelle was describing uh, a set that he was doing on his show and he's in one of the reasons why he left comedy to begin with yep. was because he was making a joke that was meant to be subversive but one of the cameramen laughed a little bit too long yep. you know, giving indications like ah you know uh yep. this this wasn't uh subversive this is um it was hitting uh, a racist um exactly. impression on him you know exactly yeah Act yeah Yes, I do remember that. I think I was in an interview with Oprah. Uh, yeah, I, and I think he's highlighting the, um, the, the, like I said earlier, the fragility of uh, subversive humor as a, a means, a tool for uh, challenging bigotry, racism. Uh, it, it doesn't always, it, sometimes it backfires. It doesn't always work as intended. Yeah. Yeah, I'm mean, in fact that it, it's I as I see it, it it likely won't depending upon people's lenses through which the 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 yeah through the biases through which they view the humor. Yeah. Well, and that being said, Tom, and that being said, because mm -hmm. you're drawing a distinction between disparagement, subversive, what's disparagement humor, mm -hmm. uh, and and. And it's not always easy to interpret and you have to look at as you said as the intent of it so many many times um you know I, I know when i'm working with clients intention is just another form of behavior that uh, is part of the the lie of the overall lie right so mm -hmm. you could say well i i don't intend for this to be offensive but really in the back of mind you do Right. Mm -hmm. How could you not interpret that to be offensive? How can we is there a way then to accurately distinguish between what is disparaging and what is meant to be subversive? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And I, in most of my work and for, for over the years has focused on the, the consequences of put down humor, humor that has that explicit uh, message of disparagement based on stereotypes or uh, prejudices. Um, and and I, I usually present uh, humor in a way that the underlying intent is not clear. Uh, so uh, and what we found is that regardless of the humorous intent, if the humor in, it carries with it that explicit message of disparagement uh, based on stereotypes of prejudice and an underlying message that this is just play, Yeah. then we have some potentially uh, negative consequences. Um, and the subversive humor uh, is separated or is distinguished from this typical disparagement humor in the sense that the creator of the humor really intends to lampoon or subvert, or excuse me, uh, uh, satirize the bigotry or prejudice right. more generally. And, and, and I think that is often hard to, to see that. I think it's often mistaken, uh, that subtext is often mistaken as it's okay to trivialize mm -hmm. discrimination against this group of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, And so there, that subversive humor is sort of a subtle variation of what I see as the default uh, uh, of, of uh, disparagement humor. You know, and personally, I, I see subversive as sort of a category of disparagement humor that has a, a pro-social intention. Yeah. And it can be used if in a pro-social way. If everybody is completely uh, completely understands yeah that the intent of the humor and so uh in my opinion uh you have to be very very careful 
with subversive humor. And I would tend to err on the side of, of like Dave Chappelle, of not <laughs> using it. Uh, because I think the default, is, the default subtext is it's okay to trivialize the, uh, the disparagement. Yeah. Uh, so that said, uh, I've not actually thought about, you know, uh, you know how we could, uh, you know, discern intention. Say when you see a meme online or, uh, you know, you read a one-liner or you, you hear a one-liner or you watch, you know, uh, in, any given, you know, watch Don Rickles. Uh, or any show that, uh, you know, Tosh.0 that capitalizes on various stereotypes and stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, in, for me, I think, and just personally, I think that when I'm watching a comedian, mm -hmm. I'm agreeing. When I sit down, I watch comedian online, or if I uh, watch on TV, I'm agreeing to play. I'm agreeing to kind of, play with the comedian's content he's going to take me along on right. sort of this 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 little playful routine and and i understand that i'm going to you know keep suspend my critical sensitivities and uh for that time being right uh, uh and, I agree. Yeah. yeah no i agree i totally agree with you and the thing is like i'm thinking about ricky gervais right when his comedy right. style if it was all just it was all um disparaging explicitly disparaging mm -hmm. then... but tonight isn't just about the people in front of the camera in this room are some of the most important tv and film executives in the world people from every background but they all have one thing in common they're all terrified of ronan farrow he's coming for you He's coming for you. Look, talking of all you perverts, it was a big year. It was a big year for paedophile movies. Um, surviving R. Kelly, Leaving Neverland, Two Popes. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. I don't care. I don't care. Many talented people of colour were snubbed in major categories. Um, Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. The Hollywood foreign press are all very, very racist. So, fifth time. So, we were going to do an in memoriam this year, but when I saw the list of people that had died, it wasn't diverse enough. It just, no. It was mostly white people. And I thought, nah, not on my watch. So, maybe next year. Let's. Let's see what happens. Then we tend to shift, you know, as, okay, from the play to, oh, well, he's probably, you know, it sounds like he's being serious. He's talking about this little too much. Mm. Uh, he then adds, disparage, you know, self disparaging humor with that mm -hmm. and, you know, a lightness and moves on to another topic where he makes fun of all these different kind of categories where you think, oh, okay. Obviously, this is play. This is not serious. He's not. He's not disparaging obese people or or uh, or any other category. He's just playing, and uh, and uh, there's a fine line. But you know, it occurs to me, it's so freaking complex, right? And right. it's just like driving a car. Driving a car is a very very complex behavior. Right, right. Um, but we do it so simply. Yeah. You know, like yeah. It's, and it's like our behavior, we don't really think about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you said something earlier about uh, you know, that subversive, that the humor can be manipulative. I don't think you use that term, but that's what I was computing. And which I'm going to add just another layer of complexity. Uh, and that is, okay, imagine Ricky Gervais, as you said, well, he's saying that a little too much. You know, is it possible that he's using humor as a cover to express his, you know, some some true hostilities and to, uh, you know, push a particular view uh, of, a, of a topic of a, of a people of a group onto the viewers, you know, create that clarification, humor experience that that new twist 
on something, a new way of thinking about something. Maybe he's taking the humor license, the license that he has through humor to, to play with these things in potentially disparaging ways uh, to, to influence, to express, yeah. to express his own prejudices and biases. Well, I don't know if Gervais does that. I'm just saying that, well, that adds another layer of complexity uh, to, to humor. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. What yeah. is the humorous intent? Yeah, yeah. No, and, and there's so many comedians who do that. One, uh, one of my favorite comedians is Norm Macdonald. All right, and so he's yeah, yeah. he's notorious for actually. Who are safer drivers, men or women? Well, according to a new survey, 55% of adults feel that women are most responsible for minor fender benders, while 78% blame men for most fatal crashes. Please note that the percentage of these pie graphs do not add up to 100% because the math was done by a woman. <laughs> For those of you hissing at that joke, it should be noted that that joke was written by a woman. So, now you don't know what the hell to do. Eh? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We don't hire women. Actually, uh, for for pushing the edge, uh, especially in our, his early days, where uh, people took great offense to what he was saying, mm -hmm. and so like the the group was definitely divided, where yeah. um, they didn't know what to think. Well, well, the thing is, great thing about him is like he didn't really care, and so he just yeah. went on with the routine, right? Um, but but at the same time. Um, uh, and Jerry Seinfeld actually talked about this too. A lot of comedians don't even do colleges anymore uh, because uh, the norm now is if one person's offended, well, then you 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 need that's on you as a comedian. You can't offend anybody, and so it it's this uh, the conservative argument is. Well, see, the liberals are always living in this kind of la-la land of uh, no one's offended, creating these safe spaces to where it's like, no, people have to be offended and certain eggs are going to be cracked, but we're going to progress as a society better. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's your feeling about that? Uh, well, I, that's, a, that's a huge topic. Yeah. Um, I, I think comedians, I'm going to, I guess, break into this topic this way. I think uh, comedians do take risks. You know, yeah. Comedians, they, they live, they make their living pressing boundaries, like you said, boundaries of decency, uh, breaking, you're just poking and stretching cultural norms, uh, moral norms, uh, uh, and so on. Uh to, uh, to create what we sometimes call benign violations, sort of playful, non-threatening uh, violations of, 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 of moral, social, cultural norms uh, to produce that shared experience of amusement, that identification function of humor it, wow. it to, so that we could all, in a sense, play together. Uh, but that's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. It, particularly when the standards of social acceptability, when the boundaries are changing. So you may be thinking that you're kind of just pushing, stretching, poking at these uh, boundaries, but uh, you know, uh, you know, but a year later you do the same thing and you're, you've obliterated them. <laughs> so you no longer have a benign violation. You've got a full fledged yeah. violation. So and it's not funny when people yeah. are offended. People yeah. don't switch to that humor mindset to, to interpret and have fun with it. Uh, and now, uh, I, I think if I, and these rules are changing, you know, these, these speech restrictions are changing, I think in the name of political correctness, uh, they're getting, and, and people are often uh, sort of uh, afraid that they're gonna say something that might be offensive, uh, that might result in the label of intolerance, get them lit up on social media, sanctioned in more formal ways. And I can imagine, and, and I think, again, like I said, comedians are particularly vulnerable to these, to these moving standards because they make their living on the edge of social acceptance. 
Uh, and so I can imagine uh, some comedians would not enjoy performing for an audience that they think is going to be scrutinizing everything they say with the intent of finding offense. Now, I think they'd prefer an audience that wants to suspend their, their critical uh, sensitivities and adopt that playful attitude we talked about. And I, I think they would find that more fun and less risky. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of two people. I'm thinking of two people based on what you said. Um, one is Sarah Silverman, and right. so Sarah Silverman made the grand mistake of when she had her own TV show of going in. On. Oh my God, Eugene! I am so sorry. You were right. It's so much harder to be black than it is to be Jewish. I'd kill myself if I were black. A lot of choice. and uh, I I don't know exactly what she was thinking. Um, it was she admitted that was a grave error of judgment okay. on her part. But what I assume knowing Sarah Silver's, Silverman's comedy was that it was a implicit message that she was sending out about, uh, uh, I guess, the denigration of blackface that it had it was supposed to have an opposite relation from what yeah. she was trying to do. Right. But now in our culture, it's like you, I mean, if you don't know blackface is not appropriate, you don't know, you don't deserve being comedy. But yeah, but I think you're, you're going back to that, the danger of trying to be subversive. Yeah, yeah. Again, that surface message and, it, and, and to get, yeah, that subversive subtext, you have to know what she was intending. And it's just not obvious. No, no, it's not. But 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 to a lot of black people, it doesn't matter what she was intending. No, you're and maybe right. she was, and, and and the argument could be, well, she knew exactly what she was doing. I mean, how could you not know the history of blackface and and how how disparaging and obscene that is? Yet she did it. So, like, what is the accountability for that? She, she I mean, she she paid a little bit of price, but she's still on the air. Mm -hmm. She's still beloved, you know. Yeah. And it, you know, it could, you know, I, I think uh, comedians, again, they take risks. They know that, uh, or they, they understand that people can be offended by uh, the, the norms that they poke at and yeah. you know, stretching the bounds of decency. Uh, and they, they kind of take a sort of a calculated risk. I mean, implicitly they do. And so right. you know, I think as they work out their, their, uh, their sets, um, and so, okay, well, this is possibly offended, but I think the benefit, I think it's really going to be hilarious for most people. I mean, if they're really leaving their, their, their criticism at the door, uh, which is what we hope they do when they go to a comedy show, uh, I think, well, this, this might be okay then. I, it, it's possible that, that Sarah Silverman was thinking, well, let's really just push this, this right. boundary. Let's. I, she's known you know, for pushing the boundaries. She's known I'm, for it. And she's, yeah, she's, she's exactly. had a great success for it. Yeah. Now yeah. Let me just thumb my nose to the fact that there is this boundary, that there is this rule. Right. This, yeah. And, and right. let me just, yeah. And, and maybe and that'll go over. Maybe people will, will, will sort of take it in a playful way and laugh and enjoy that. But that's not what happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and on a similar note, uh, you know, <clears throat> Louis C.K., uh, a little, a little, well, of course, we all know the history of, of, of Louis C.K. and what he did, and uh, I thought he was done. When he did that, I, I thought he was done in comedy, like how his whole jokes, all his jokes are related to masturbation and, and sexual dysfunction and whatnot. How in the world could he come back from that? Um, but he, uh, he did. Um, and I think he did so brilliantly, uh, uh, independent of what you, you know, what a person thinks personally of Louis CK, I think that in terms of the genius of his comedy is there. Um, and so I, so he was making a tour and I bought tickets and I was bought tickets to New Orleans. I was going to go. And, and then, um, and then my wife said, don't go. And my, my, my own daughter, who was uh, like uh, 12, 12 or 13 at the time, was pleading with me, Dad, don't go. Like, what are you thinking? Well, I chose not to go because my family, of course, is more important than seeing a comedian on stage. 
<laughs> but I, it's like, am I, am I a, a, a pig for thinking, well, I want to see Louis C.K. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or is, <laughs> and not be on the bandwagon of, of uh, you know, what, what, is, what is the kind of behavior or level of comedy where, where it's, it's appropriate to say everyone should be on board of ostracizing and then, and where is the level of forgiveness in our society? Saying, okay, yes, we're going. We're not, his behavior was not acceptable. We're going to forgive it, and we're going to enjoy his, his comedy. Yeah, and I think what you're the that scenario it, it spans beyond comedy to the, the ways we think about celebrities in general. Um, and so we could appreciate somebody's talent, like you said, the genius of Louis C.K.'s comedy. Mm -hmm. um, you could appreciate, uh, you know, the, the talent of, of, a, of a, I could appreciate, the, I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, so I could appreciate the talent of Antonio Brown, but you know, he was uh, accused of uh, you know, sexual misconduct uh -huh. and by a number of women. I, you know, I'm not, yeah. Yeah. That, it's upsetting. Yeah. But, it's a very similar question you know can i can i then sort of root for antonio brown to do well huh. in the next Steeler game huh. uh you know um uh well we kind of compartmentalize i think yeah uh, and we think okay well i don't support antonio brown as a person or louis ck as a person i think what they did or their behavior that you know everything about them as individuals might be really reprehensible but man their talent is admirable yeah and well not only that i mean uh you know you think about woody allen yeah. i think his, i think his talent is extraordinary right but yeah. i would not support one of his movies again yeah, um right. and, and i think bill cosby <laughs> I used to love Bill Cosby growing up. Listen to his albums and just like, oh my God, he was like, he was he was an icon of comedy. I would I would never listen to him again. They they did something uh, that was so um, that that flavored um, their comedy uh, uh, where it's um, it's not funny anymore. You know, whatever they talk about is not funny. They're not funny as people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. Louis C.K. though is oftentimes painted with, in those those kind, of, painted with a broad brush of everybody who is a Me Too movement is the same. So Bill Cosby, Louis C.K., uh, whoever, right, um, is painted with a broad brush and and should be seen the same way. I think there's a. It, it leads to a mass confusion in society about who to support and who not to. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. And, then, and I would add, I mean, a couple of thoughts about that. And, and first is that, yeah, I, I would not support Louis C.K. either. I wouldn't go to, his, to, uh, to a show because I wouldn't want to, uh, to support him. And when mm -hmm. I pay my money to go to the show, I, I am... Yeah, and I'm supporting Louis C.K. Yeah. Uh, now, that's different than if I watch Antonio Brown and it's third and long, and I am hoping he catches the pass that comes his way. Okay, yeah, but somehow there, there's, there's, that's a difference. I, you know, I'm not gonna, yeah, uh, I'm yeah. not, I'm directly supporting uh, Antonio Brown, but in this case, yeah, I definitely uh, agree that. Yeah, there. When you go to the show, you are you are saying that I I support that I I'm actually want to help you know you help this guy make a living. Yeah, yeah, true. But you know what else though um, uh, about what you said is that I think it's it the, the confusion you mentioned is very very important because I think uh, you know this you know speech restrictions are are, are are stricter they're confusing they're not necessary they're confusing and uh, yeah. I think it it gives it creates possibilities for people to um, overstep inadvertently and then once you do that once you say something that could be construed as you know offensive 
to a, uh, it's, it's potentially offensive to members of a, a minoritized group because it's somehow or possibly related to uh, you know oppression. Uh, then people have the grounds they feel to label you as a civil rights violator. And that, right. that is tantamount to being immoral. You're racist, sexist, homophobic. Right. And once that happens, it, they're morally justified to cancel you, to silence you. Mm -hmm. And you know, that goes, that, that sticks. I mean, look at Kevin Hart to what had some tweets in what, 2010. <laughs> So, right. you know, yeah. okay, well, then in 2019, they don't want yeah. him to host the Academy right. Awards. Well, yeah. uh, you know, that's different than Louis C.K., who's who has who's been uh, who's a, who has been at least accused of sexual misconduct by several women. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, some right. what Kevin Hart did was he had made a few tweets, probably pushing the boundaries, mm -hmm. trying to be funny mm -hmm. in 2010. Well, the boundaries have changed. And so that same little uh, jostling of the boundaries now obliterates them. And then now he's being held accountable today or in 2019 by the standards of, uh, you know, his behavior in 2011 is being judged by the standards of 2019 and it's not forgiving. Well, I mean, and let me push back on that a little bit too, because if, if I was a gay male uh, yeah. growing up from 70s, yeah. 80s, 90s, right? And I was, and, I, and so I felt the heavy discrimination, the rights and freedoms of um, the LGBTQ community has grown so quickly over time. Yeah. I would want to continue pressing my foot down on the gas of that pro progress mm -hmm. and and um, confront any any person who has a history of that, just to bring that to light. Mm -hmm. Is that um, well, you, I think that positive? No, I th I can understand that sentiment, uh, and I'm not sure that uh, Kevin Hart had a history. Uh, I mean, I think there's an incident, uh, yeah. but I also think that if, in in fairness, I think that 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 person you're describing, that hypothetical. Uh, would I, I think could be very vi vigilant in, in enforcing the these sort of these new moral standards now. I don't see how it's fair to to take it. I mean, I mean these moral standards are changing, so they're relative. Uh, right. There's some relativism if they're changing, but to act to apply them absolutely, to apply relative moral standards absolutely across time. Uh, when the standards didn't exist to hold somebody accountable to these new standards, I, I don't know. That seems a, a lit. I'm not sure that that uh, really would help that person's cause. I think being very vigilant about what what's acceptable now, rather than punishing people uh, for ten, you know, something they might have said ten years ago by the standards of what's appropriate. Now, that to me seems a little, well, without my, you know, keep in mind, Kevin Mark, Kevin Hart also apologized. Yeah. The apology yeah. wasn't True. enough. It's True. just, yeah. it's just enough. Ellen DeGeneres supported him. That wasn't yeah. enough. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it, so once you get that label of, yeah. of uh, a civil rights violator, which is tantamount to being immoral, I, I think it's hard to shake. And the confusion yeah. you talked about uh, is, is, I think, very dangerous uh, for comedians who are you know, pushing the boundaries yeah. because the boundaries are going to change and you're going to be accountable for your boundary pushing today by standards that don't even exist yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and kind of moving on from there, but, but Tishby, you know, the, the comedians of the old days where one, one of my favorite groups was... Um, uh, growing up as a kid was the Three Stooges. Take it dirty. One of these days, I'll tell you. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, Mo. It was a loose board. A loose board? I don't see any loose boards. Here. Yeah. Oh. oh, forgive me. Hit. Hit me with that and we'll be all be even. No, I couldn't hit you with that. But I can with this. Oh. 
See that? <laughs> Come on, break it up. We got work to do inside. Well, then take it on. Oh. That kind of safe, yeah, that kind of safe comedy where you just, you know what? It was just yeah. enjoyable. It was just fun. It wasn't political. It wasn't right. necessarily ra- intended to be racist. Although, you know, I mean, we're right. talking about 40s, 50s. So yeah, there was from racism there. Um, but but uh, it wasn't intended to be racist or hateful or sexist or anything like that. To, it wasn't expected to push the boundaries. It was just enjoyable. Do you do we see now uh, less of that kind of comedy? Is there a need for that kind of comedy today? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, you know, I think is uh, the comedy is, is has changed so much. Uh, the way that this you know stand up comedy developed, I think, in the you know fifties and sixties, then nineteen fifties. And, and it, it really evolved and changed. Um, and, and I know the Stooges weren't uh, stand-up, but I think the changes in stand-up are sort of are, are a little more generalized. Uh, so stand-up comics used to, and at first would stand up and tell jokes. You know, mm. Like think of Bob Hope. <laughs> one joke like after another yeah. joke. And then, yeah. you know, a joke to another joke. And then, you know, people like Lenny Bruce, began yeah. to just talk about yeah. their life they began to you know talk about their depression and their alcoholic dad bill hicks and, yeah you know and and things like that uh that they they from their true from their lives that they drew upon for comedy mm-hmm. and i think that comedy stand-up comedy is much less just tell one joke after another versus you know, let's draw upon sort of common experience uh, that people have e- that could either be painful or, or yeah. uh, you know, like, uh, you know, growing up uh, really poor or um, as the, the child of an alcoholic parent mm-hmm. or, you know, ha- experiencing right. some trauma. So capitalize on that experience that people can share in our, their their common knowledge, understanding of that, and you can make light of it uh, in a way that brings us together. You know, we're all right. in, the, you know, and, right. and we relate to one another through that common bond, and uh, or uh, uh, just just common uh, cultural experience, not necessarily painful. Right. But I think that's just more common than than uh, one joke after another. Right, but that that's relatively new in our culture, though, right? Because if you think of the olden yes. days with with uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen and Bob Hope and Jonathan Winters and, and yeah. all those, that was clean comedy. People loved that. You didn't touch on social issues, you know what? But then when the Lenny Bruce and Bill Hicks and George Carlin came on stage, where they talked about real yes. biting issues, um, is that why do you think first off that's a really good question why do you think that there was a change or a shift in their in, in our culture well i think that that sh- that shift in in comedy reflected and just a uh, cultural broader cultural changes yeah uh, in our country and, yeah. I, and i think it, that's comedy is not the only place where you see such shifts but it's i think a it's a good example of, of sort of a shift in uh, sort of cultural criticism uh, uh, of a willingness to, uh, you know, yeah, to talk about painful things, a willingness to criticize uh, the status quo uh, and um, mock and make fun of um, common uh, traditional institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but I, I just think that people weren't as apt to do that mm-hmm. prior to, let's say, in the prior to the 1960s. It yeah. seems like 1960s. I mean, it, just in general, that yeah. we were we were seeing a shift in, in our willingness to be more um, you know, to, to protest. I guess. You know, right, right. Well, you think about everything that was going on at the time. 
you know, the end of the Korean War, Vietnam, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, economic instability, uh, growing wealth disparity, all these kind of things that that uh, were uh, converged into a yeah. need for, for a need for a type of comedy that was subversive that, you know, that's really. But if you're with the bishop's wife at lunch, it's better not to ask for the goddamn lettuce. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just like we've decided there'd be some words we won't say all the time. And I was just trying to find out which words they were. For sure. All of them. I wanted a list. Because nobody gives you a list. That's the problem. They don't give you a list. Wouldn't you think it'd be normal if they didn't want you to say something to tell you what it is? Nobody even tells you when you're a kid what the words are that you're supposed to avoid. You have to say them to find out which ones they are. Shit! Oh, fuck! Oh, Ma, that's enough trial and error, huh? Please, Ma, give me a list, huh? Hearing George Carlin for the first time, and I love the man, and he's still, like, uh, you know, my top five comedians today, George Carlin was brilliant, and it just rang true. I think that Roddy Dangerfield, I saw him in concert one time. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, tonight it's, tonight it's nice to be a grown-up crowd, too, you know. I did a show last week for a bunch of teenagers. Are these kids coming on today? You can't tell boys from girls. I mean, the girls that wear slacks, fellas let their hair grow. I was talking to someone yesterday, look at that teenager, what's that, a boy or a girl? He said, that's a boy, that's my son. I said, sure, you knew you're his father. He said, I'm not his father, I'm his mother. <laughs> I don't know, I'll tell you, life isn't easy. After a while, I don't know who to believe anymore. Well, the other day I was in my bank, they got signs all over there. At this bank of a friend. Last month I was two payments behind. My friend took away my car. <laughs> I tell you, with me, nothing comes easy, nothing, you know. Well, last week I saw my dentist, not a beauty, my dentist. I said to him, can you put in a new tooth to match my other teeth? He put in a tooth with four cavities. <laughs> I think that he's funny. Yeah. Uh, in a different kind of way. Like, I would rather really pay money to see George Carlin than a Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. Ro because George Carlin pushed that edge. And that's what I need. That's, Rod I yeah, that's Rodney was from, yeah, Rodney was a different generation comedian. Right. right. Yeah. He was suited for the 1950s and earlier, you know, right, right. more in the Bob Hope era. You know. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But certain, also a certain. I mean, he survived through the 80s, and certain, certainly Absolutely. in that same type of comedy, where it yeah. seems to me that there is a large segment of the population that doesn't want to think, they don't want to be um, rattled. They don't want to be um, feel they're part of a subversive cult. They just want to laugh. Yeah, exactly. And plus, you know, he was good. I mean, good comics are, he's I won. think, yeah, are going to be good. successful yeah. in, in different styles. And uh, you know, I think there's there's room for a, a Rodney Dangerfield today. I think Chris Farley was yeah. uh, a lot like Rodney Dangerfield yeah. in that self disparaging mm -hmm. humor. Mm -hmm. Humor. And yeah. you know, kind of making himself the butt of the joke. He yeah. was great at that. Um, I, you know, I think there's a market for good, good talent, and yeah. you know, regardless of style and and, uh, and, and yeah. And, but I do see, you know, comedy is as a whole is, has has had made some shifts, and yeah. the way that people tend to uh, perform. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do want to leave on, um, you know, because I know it's getting late and I want to be respectful of your time. The whole term, I didn't know this term before, geolatology. Gel, Have you ever heard of geolatology? Or am I pronouncing that right? It was, uh, it was um, um, basically it was uh, that the healing power of comedy, right? And there's all these clinical studies about how comedy or uh, how humor can heal you when you are sick or mentally ill mm. and the mm. use of that. And I wanna get your perspective and your take on the use of, of humor uh, as it relates to healing the ills that we see today, uh, both psychological and physical. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, um, there there is a lot of uh, work on those topics. There's a, you know a lot written on those topics, and uh, and there there's you know some of what is written on these topics is based on sort of sound empirical research, and um, uh, other is is not not necessarily. Now, I think that um, I, I don't see uh, humor as sort of, uh, you know, the, the best medicine for uh, physical ailment. We'll talk about both physical ailment, physical healing, as well as uh, mental health. I, I don't see it as, the, you know, the best medicine. Mm-hmm. As, uh, you know, you might, you might go to Walmart and get a sign, you know, laughter is the best medicine. You put it up in your kitchen. But, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a nice sign, but I don't, I'm not sure I believe it. Um, uh, you know, and I think the, the, the idea of humor and its, and its healing, uh, power probably came from, uh, I mean, the real, uh, interest in it, I think probably came from the, uh, um, uh, what's cousins, uh, I'm forgetting his first name. Um, uh, Mormon uh, cousins? what's that? Mormon cousins? Mormon cousins. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. There, there's an ice there's an ice skater named robin cousins and his name was blocking norman for me so uh but yeah norman cousins uh he had this debilitating illness and he and his doctor came up with a a, a really uh well they a really unique and and um unconventional regimen for treatment that involved a lot of vitamin c and a lot of comedy he, he laughed a lot yeah and, and he uh, attributes his, his uh, recovery to laughter. And one of the remarkable things that has stuck from Norman Cousins' experience, that's, and it's received a lot of empirical support, is the role of mirthful laughter. So not just fake laughter, but genuine mirth that results in laughter. Mm-hmm. Mirthful laughter is, is a very, uh, it, it is effective in reducing uh, mild levels of pain. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and Norman Cousins talked about the, the pain relief that he would get from um, that mirthful laughter. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I, I think there's, there are certainly uh, responses in the, you know, the nervous system and the renal system uh, uh, that I think are instrumental in uh, improving health uh, that, yeah, that are related to mirthful laughter. Um, yep, yeah, let's see. Yeah, so it, it definitely empirical research supports the idea that exposure to humor uh, you know, uh, increases pain tolerance and also reduces pain a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, regarding mental health, I, I think humor is very, very, humor can act in two ways, I see it. Uh, one is a protective and an, another is sort of an intervention. Mm-hmm. And so I think that people who go through life in a way, and they use humor uh, as they go through life in a way to cope with life's stressors and challenges and difficulties, they tend to be inoculated from emotional distress from those they, they they're protected from the emotional distress of of challenges and difficulties and the way that uh, and we call and, and broad martin calls this self-enhancing humor style that the people have a self-enhancing humor style they use humor to uh, as as a way to reframe difficult stressful threatening events to make those things seem less and well, humor does that. It makes something seem less, less serious, less good, less moral, less, less threatening. Uh, and so when we diminish through humor the things that are threatening us, make fun of the stressors that we have, well, we make those stressors you know, less serious, less threatening through humor. And, they, and we're better able, better able to deal with them right. when they are more manageable size. Right. Uh, and then secondly, I think that uh, that well, so if, if that's true and there's empirical research to support that idea, um, 
then then would it be possible to uh, have people who don't go through life with a self-enhancing humor, but it, would it be possible to help them respond to specific stressors as if they did have a self-enhancing humor style? So mm -hmm. in other words, what if we uh, expose people to some sort of difficult, stressful experience, but we get them to uh, laugh at it, to uh, make light of it, to think about it from a humorous perspective, to find humor in the difficulty. Uh, right. If we give them some exercises to do that in, uh, in response to a stressful event, well, could there be some benefit? And, and there's some research that actually my students and I have done in, in the lab that show that, well, yeah, there is. So, so, for instance, if we give people a math test, this really difficult math test, this, the, the subject knows, the participant knows that it's coming, creates arousal, it creates anxiety, sympathetic nervous system uh, is activated and they're, they're nervous. Uh, okay, while waiting for this math test and this stressful event, Let's make light of it. Let's expose them to some comedy. And, and will that mitigate the emotional um, effect of the stressful event? And will it decrease anxiety? Well, in fact, it does. And we have a, a variety of experiments to show that exposure to humor, uh, humorous cartoons will mitigate the anxiety that this math test is having. And actually then, therefore, improve performance on the test. Yeah. And then we can even accentuate that a bit through by tweaking the humor to uh, target math, to target the very stressful event that's mm -hmm. the very event that's causing stress. So mm -hmm. we give them jokes that make fun of math tests and math. And we found some memes and some jokes to do that. And we get them to write out a joke. I mean, and what anyway? So they they read these jokes that are uh, belittling, making light of this stressful event, and then they're also um, writing out to share with other people some jokes that do the same. Well, that can have some benefit in reducing the experienced anxiety uh, created by the by the test. So I think that, that humor can act as, a, as an intervention. In fact, there's a, 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 a strategy developed by Paul McGee in, in, in I guess, 72 or 74. And it's called the Seven Habits uh, uh, Program. It's, it's about training people to use humor in day-to-day -day life you know, so that on their own, over time, on their own, they will have adopted some skills to use humor in response to stressful events to mitigate the consequences of uh, difficulty, challenge, and stressors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that, that has received empirical support. And not only, I mean, it's received empirical support internationally. That, that's, that, that's a real promising line of research. Yeah, I'm wondering along those same lines, uh, if, there is a, if there's research done uh, between the success of uh, a class with a teacher who does use humor on a regular basis to build that rapport, not only build that rapport with, with, with students, but to reduce stress versus yeah. a, 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 very, a very serious but competent teacher. Yeah. 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 In, in that humor in a classroom is a very nuanced and sort of mm. complex phenomenon. Sometimes humor can uh, lead to better learning as measured by recall, but other times it, it doesn't. Sometimes you, you're focused on getting the humor and, and then you're focused on the humor and you miss some non-humorous details of a, of, a, of a lecture or a, a lesson plan. Right. So there's some mixed results regarding the the function of humor as in the classroom as a tool for teaching and learning. Yeah, I can see. I can totally see that. And, I, and I'm wondering if it's more successful if it, if the humor is functionally related to the subject yeah. at hand. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, there is some evidence that suggests that if the humor 
is uh, is uh, is there's a variation in humor uh, because is taken by some as dismissive, uh, while others, you know, it decreases. So, like, there's variability in how people, how how the listener receives the humor too. You can either increase or decrease the anxiety level. Yeah. Oh uh, well, see, and as well, yeah. Uh, do we should the humor uh, have sort of that identification function? Should it be yeah. affiliative? Or what if it's disparaging or if it's self-disparaging, yeah. does it have the same pounds? Yeah. Wow. It is complex. <laughs> yeah, it's complex. I feel like we can talk about this for another couple yeah. of hours. Is there anything is there anything that you want to discuss that we haven't discussed? No. I, this has been yeah. fun. No, I yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, I'm glad they did this. The thing is, is you know, is one of the subjects that I don't really hear too much discussion about, but okay. it's so prevalent in our community, in, in our society, and so important, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, important. I agree. I agree. Yeah. One of the most very complex subjects. I thank you so much for being here with me and, and, uh, and helping uh, our listeners understand. Uh, oh. I, I, I think that we, we, uh, we probably added more questions than we. Yeah. Than, than answers, but that's okay, right? That's education. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I appreciate you, and uh, and thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be on your show. I really appreciate it. Spit on the ground, hold your breath, try to scare yourself to death. Bury your bones under the dirt and tear your heart and rip your shirt and stomp your feet in disgust. Curse the gray skies if you must, but you'll find when you are done. Blue skies for everyone. And dig up your wine, break your heart, and give up the race before you start. Drop your drawers and roll around, burn your house right to the ground, go to sleep. Your head, screaming till your face is red, but you'll find when you are done. 